Well, I'm glad that you're here tonight. We got some ground to make up since I wasn't here last week, and so tonight we're going to work on 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and 7, and I have it laid out all the way through, so we should be able to finish it tonight. And if we don't, see, see, Wendy's already given me grief about that. If we don't, we're all just going to tell Wendy it was her fault. I don't know why it would be her fault, but before we get started, let's stop and pray. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to go through these chapters with these folks. I thank you for your tremendous grace to us, how you continually uh, pull us back into your arms, continuously use us, and remind us that we're your children and that you're not done with us yet. I thank you, Lord. As we look at these chapters tonight, I pray that you'd speak to our hearts. We thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. What comes to your mind when I talk about an evangelical Christian? What kind of a picture comes to your mind? Billy Graham. Ooh, that's good. What kind of picture might come to your mind when you think of an evangelical Christian minister? For most people, When I mention an evangelical Christian, if you just get on the plane with your plane ticket and you sit in your seat and some stranger comes and sits next down to you and you say to the stranger, so I'm an evangelical Christian, what they're immediately going to think is politics. This person has a political mindset and they're going to try to sway me to believe in their particular idea or if they're willing to give you a fair shake, they may, instead of think politics, they may think morality. This person has a particular moral bent, and they're going to feel like, the person who's not the evangelical Christian will say, the evangelical Christian will feel like I am wrong if I don't go along with their particular bent. They may even immediately be afraid of being judged because you said you're an evangelical Christian. Now, when you say evangelical Christian minister, well, they're probably either going to picture someone sort of Hillsong-ish, wearing skinny jeans and a V-neck, bouncing around the stage, or they're going to picture someone old, white, male, and loud. That's what... That's what we hear people outside of the church think about evangelical Christians. I have made it a little bit of a personal mission in my own life and hope that you do the same to change that opinion anytime I can. I want people to associate tremendous grace with the concept of evangelical Christian. I want people to think, evangelical Christian, aren't they the ones that love the people that nobody loves? Aren't they the ones that care about the babies nobody cares about and care about the old folks nobody cares about and go into the hospitals where nobody's willing to visit certain patients? Aren't aren't they the ones that care about those people? Aren't they the ones that have a a message of, of hope and love and joy for everyone? Aren't they the ones who, boy, if you meet an evangelical Christian, you'll just never be lonely again? That's what I would like people to think. I would like people to immediately think grace, the most wonderful people you'll ever meet. I mean, the only way that's going to happen is, well, on a one-on-one basis, as we get to know people one-on-one and they find out that we're not loud political watchdogs with a moral agenda. They find out, no, no, these are people that actually, that actually deeply and desperately love me. The good thing about being misunderstood as a Christian is that that's been something that's been happening since the very beginning. Since people were first called Christians, there's been a misunderstanding about what they're doing and why they're doing it. It began with the whole body and blood of Christ thing. Wait a minute, you people get together on Sunday morning and eat the body and blood of Christ? That's weird. And sounds remarkably cannibalistic. And for some time, Christians were sidelined as being 
some kind of weird cannibalistic cult just because of that idea. And then there came the whole thing of the Roman plagues. You know, during the end of the first century and on into the second century, there were just a number of, of um, epidemics that went through Rome, a number of different kinds of plagues where people in the city were getting sick. Uh, Nero actually used, uh, used that to blame Christians for a while. What's well, the Christians in the city that are getting people sick? And the reason that he said that was because, you know, the town would start to get sick and all the rich people would start to leave. I mean, there was no six-foot distance in masking. They split, got out of the city, leaving the sick people in the city. Well, guess who came to the city to help the sick people? The Christians came flooding back into the city to help the people who were sick and dying of these various bacterial diseases that they just didn't understand. And then there was the thing with the unwanted children. You know, in Rome, they didn't practice abortion in the Roman Empire. What, what they would do, I mean, they were much more civilized than that, what they would do is if a baby was born and it had some kind of perceived defect or was simply unwanted, the father wouldn't receive the child, well, then they just set the baby outside in the street. Just set the baby out there at night. It wouldn't be there in the morning. You know, the exposure would kill the baby. The wild animals would come and carry it off. That was how they dealt with babies. Well, until Christians went around and started picking them up. These babies sitting in the street crying at night. Unwanted babies, babies with Down syndrome, with deformed limbs or other sorts of, of genetic or mental problems, or babies that were just unwanted. Dad wanted a boy, it's a girl, put it outside. The Christians would go around and collect them at night and take them home and adopt them and raise them as their own children. And the world just didn't understand. Christians are weird, man. Why do they want these? What are they doing with these babies? What are they doing with these babies nobody wants? Are they really cannibals? Why are they helping the sick people? Why do they care about sick people? They're pretty sick themselves. People just didn't understand Christians. They really didn't understand Paul. Man, Paul was the strangest of all Christians. Because Paul was smarter than that. Remember how Festus told him, your great learning is driving you insane. He was smarter than all of this. He, it didn't make sense to have someone so well educated, so wealthy, so politically powerful, leave behind all of that to go hang out with sick, loving, cannibalistic baby snatchers. And Paul took a lot of heat for it. Even Paul's own churches often didn't understand him. He spends, as we're going to learn as we go through some more of the letters, he spends a great amount of time in his letters just explaining himself. Because even his own churches didn't understand. And one of them, of course, is this church in Corinth that we've been talking about. Remember, he was in Corinth for about a year and a half. He was there. It was the second longest individual church planting ministry and it's possible that he went back to Corinth more than he went back to any other group of people. Understand that the account that we have in Acts has a lot of holes in it. There's just a lot of things we don't know about. But Paul talks about having gone back to Corinth a second time, possibly a third time, maybe even a fourth time. That he went back to this church more than any other church. He spent time with the people in Corinth, and yet they still didn't understand him. He'd leave. And sin would creep into the church. And false teachers would creep into the church. And strange ideas would creep in. And they somebody would write, Paul, we don't know what to do about this. And he would respond. And it became a regular cycle. And that's what we've been working through here in 2 Corinthians. The letter we call 2 Corinthians. Which we know wasn't his second letter to the Corinthian church. Might have been his third, might have been more than that, we're not sure, but we know there were other letters that had gone back and forth before this one. But we know that the one that we call 1 Corinthians was a letter that he wrote to straighten some things out. He refers to it at one point as his harsh letter. He really called them on the carpet. He told them, 
You guys are, are involved in some sin that's not okay. You're involved in some practices that might not be sinful, but they are not a good idea. And you're celebrating some things that just ought not be celebrated. He works through much of their response in 2 Corinthians. You might remember, and it's going to come up again today in our study here, that one of the things he specifically dealt with in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, a man who was involved in a very specific type of adultery and perversity, that he said, you guys need to deal with this man. And they did, you might remember, deal with the man. He brought that up right at the first chapter. I think it's verse 9 of 2 Corinthians. That they had, had dealt with the guy and that it worked. And now the guy was remorseful and wanted to come back into their group and they were to treat him properly and accept him on, you know, on those terms and those kinds of things. As he goes through the letter of 2 Corinthians, we find out that the harsh letter of 1 Corinthians worked pretty well. Now, there are a couple of problems that Paul faces as he writes this. And one of the biggest problems that he faces is that in between his visit there and this letter of 2 Corinthians, some people had come in and said, why are you even listening to Paul anyway? Paul is a double talker. He sounds real Judaistic to the Jews, but he sounds real Gentileistic to the Gentiles. Why are you even listening to Paul? Why are you even listening to Paul? He's not even a real apostle. He didn't get his marching orders from Peter and Paul and John and James. Paul, I included him. How about just Peter, John, and James? He didn't get his marching orders from the church, you see. So he's not a real apostle. And remember, these guys were going around with letters that they'd said had been written by the main apostles at the church in Jerusalem that were their credentials. The apostle Peter said, it's okay for me to preach, so I'm here to preach. The apostle James said, it's okay for me to preach, I'm here to preach. Remember that. Even though there really wasn't any proof that those letters came from those guys, these were their credentials. And so the folks over in Corinth said, so so Paul, they showed us credentials. Where are your credentials? This is one of the themes that he's been dealing with throughout this letter. A lot of that stuff comes to a head right here in chapter 6 and in chapter 7. Now remember where we were in chapters 4 and 5. We talked a lot about eternity. Paul spent a lot of time talking about what we can expect from here. Remember that toward the end of chapter 5, one of my favorite sections in the entire Bible, Paul talks about how we understand people now not from a worldly perspective. We don't see things as the world sees. We understand things from an eternal perspective, from a new perspective, because we're new creations. The old died in Christ, So if anybody's in Christ, the old them died, and now they have new. And so your perspective on everything ought to be new. And in this perspective, he said, we have been assigned, all of us, as ambassadors. By who? Peter and John? No. By Christ himself, we've been assigned as ambassadors. And as ambassadors, we represent the kingdom. We speak on behalf of the kingdom. And what does the kingdom have to say? The kingdom has to say, be reconciled to God. And so our job as Christian people is to be ambassadors going around pleading with people to be reconciled to God. Why? Because it's time. Now it's time. Today is the day. Tomorrow we might not have that chance. So let's be reconciled to God now. Which, incidentally, just on the off chance that somebody might be listening, who's been thinking about that for a while. Maybe their relationship with God is not what it ought to be. But they think, that's okay, I'll I'll get there. It'll take some time, but I'll get there. Paul says, today, today is the day of reconciliation. Today you have that opportunity. Tomorrow you just might not. I mean, nobody expected Shelley to go home last week, particularly not her. It's been about a year, I think, about my friend Chris quite a bit. He certainly did not expect to get up on Friday morning and within a couple hours have a heart attack and die. He didn't didn't expect that. The guy's my age. He's got a family at home. Good job. Prospects for the future. Life's good. One morning, life was over. It's a good thing he was ready. We just don't know. So if you're listening and, and you just things just aren't right, well, now it's time. It's time today. 
It's an acceptable time for salvation, he tells us. Today's the day to be reconciled to God. He, he has done some amazing things, as we're going to read about even more as we go through. And oh, Sunday is going to be great as we take a look at what God's done for us. All he asks us to do is reach out our hand and say, I want to be reconciled. You know, God is not, um, God's really not judgmental of us. I think a lot of people are really afraid that God's going to know what they did and, or how they treated him or what their attitude has been or just whatever. God's going to know when he's going to be mad. But that's just not how God works. He's not mad. Oh, we read a lot in the Bible about the judgment of God. I, I understand. And there's coming a day, there is coming a day when everybody will face the judgment of God, at least everybody who hasn't reconciled and made it right. There's, there is definitely coming that day. But we're in this unique period of time where he's just ready, willing, and able to forgive and reconcile with anybody who calls on him. A unique time period. Today is that day. So we take advantage of it. That's where Paul left us off there at the beginning of chapter 6. By the way, you know that when Paul wrote this, he didn't write along and then say, now chapter 6. You know, like Paul Harvey, now page two. Paul didn't do that. He, this is one letter that he wrote all together. In the 13th century, a copyist, a monk, decided it would be a lot easier to understand Isaiah if he could just kind of cut it up into sections. And that's where we started getting chapters. And then in the 15th century, to make it even easier to teach, another copyist monk said, it would be easier if I could take some of these sections and, and really break them down into verses. That, that's why we have that. So, so you might see that chapter 6 and chapter 7 start in really weird spots in the text. That's, that's just because that's what they did to make it easier to, to teach. So, so don't, let those, don't let those breaks become natural breaks in your mind. The topic switches at verse 3, not at verse 1 in chapter 6. In verse 3, after talking about the fact that this is the acceptable time for salvation, and that's the job that we are to be doing as ambassadors, Paul starts talking about his own ministry. He says, We are not giving anyone an occasion for offense so that the minister will not be or pardon me, so that the ministry will not be blamed. Instead, as God's ministers, we commend ourselves in everything. Paul is understanding that um, his own faith is confusing to the outside world and that his work as a minister is going to be questioned as a result. And he wants to make sure that the questions are fair and honest, that he's not causing any problems. This is a, a big thing that I think every Christian minister, which by the way you realize minister means servant, so that's you too, this is something that every Christian minister needs to stop and think about. The activity that I do, how will it affect the service of the kingdom? The choices I make, the things I'm involved in. You know, we get calls all the time from different groups that want to partner with us here in the church. And you know, very rarely we actually do partner with those groups. It's not because I don't like what they're doing or maybe personally might support their movement. It's because my biggest concern is in partnering with another group. How is that going to reflect on the community at large? When the community at large sees what I'm doing here as the minister of this church, what are they going to think? Are they going to think this is a place of great grace where I can come and find Christ? Or are they going to think, well, this is a political movement or a legal movement or one of those kinds of things? So we tend to be very careful about how we do things. Paul is saying the same thing. I'm not going to give anyone an occasion for offense, he says, so that the ministry will not be blamed. I'm not telling you not to get involved in things. Just remember that your main thing you're already involved in is an ambassador for the kingdom. And what kind of work ought the ambassadors be involved in? That's what we ought to be considering. He says, instead, as God's servants or ministers... 
we commend ourselves in everything. What is our letter of recommendation, he says? Well, I'm about to give it to you, Paul says, my letter of recommendation. I was uh, listening to and reading through uh, John Corson's comments on this, and he says that verses 4 through 10 is basically the Bible college that Paul went to. And he says, verse 4 begins telling us about his coursework in becoming a minister. What is his coursework? Well, by great endurance or patience would be the word there. By great patience, he's commended as a minister. That he has acted in a way that's tremendously patient. I both love and hate that he starts with patience. Um, I've, I'm, most ministers I've met are not particularly patient people. I'm not a particularly patient guy. You want to see a patient pastor, Jerry Kester, our DS, man, what a patient guy. I mean, I can immediately think of him because they're pretty rare. Most pastors that I know have high expectations and expect things done yesterday, please. And, and I would be one of them. It's just part of the thing. But Paul says, we who are ministers, all of us, should be people of great patience. I think that's part of having grace having so much grace for somebody that no matter how many times they flub and foible and fall down and how many times they rebel, we just continue to stand there with our arms open. Patience. Great patience, he says. And we commend ourselves by afflictions. That word uh, affliction is the word philipsis. We've talked about that quite a bit. It's often called trial or tribulation or testing. And it comes from the uh, concept of a great pressing, like you might press a clove of garlic. It comes from that that concept, philipsis. This is what Jesus promised us we would have much of in this world. Paul says, because of my patience, because of my philipsis, because of hardships, this is the term distresses, and it comes out of the concept of deeply pressing needs. Because I have had very many deeply pressing needs, Paul says, and by difficulties. That is the, um, that word difficulties comes from a metaphor that has to do with traversing through a very narrow crevice. You know, like you see these really nutsoids people that do all of this uh, uh, cave spelunking. And they go down into the bottom of a cave and there's like a hole that's really not big enough for a human, but they slither through there to see what's on the other side. That's just, there's something wrong in their heads. Yes, I don't even know. Anyway, that's the idea. Difficulties. Paul says that's what it's been like being a minister. Paul's giving the impression that this is what it ought to be like to be a Christian, to be a servant of the kingdom, to be an ambassador. One ought to have to have great patience and face afflictions and hardships and difficulties. Paul goes on. Other courses that he took in his accreditation program to be a minister, beatings, this would be judicial beatings. So being hit by rods was how the Romans did it. Being whipped with a whip is how the Jews did it. He's talked about that. He tells us five times he was given 39 lashes minus one, pardon me, 40 lashes minus one by the Jews. He said those are part of what he experienced in becoming a minister. By imprisonments, note that this was written likely before the events at Philippi, certainly before the events at Caesarea, where he was in prison for a long period of time. Apparently, being in prison was just part of something Paul did. You know, most of us go into a strange town, start looking for a hotel to stay at. Apparently, Paul just went and found the local jail because he knew that's where he was going. He spent time there. By riots, that term riots, tumults is another way to say it, getting involved in scuffles, labors, that's hard work, by hard work, by sleepless nights, it literally means by watching in the night, staying up all night, keeping watch, and by times of hunger, just not having enough. If those are the courses that he took, then the majors that he took come next, the things that he majored in. Purity. That's huge. This is not simple chastity. This is sincerity. So it was not just that he was pure by not involving himself in immoral things, but he was also pure in his approach. He was completely sincere. 
And I think that's just absolutely, quite possibly, one of the most important things that a Christian servant needs to be in the world. And I think we need to absolutely go over the top about it. Remember all the grief that Mike Pence got when he refused to meet alone with a female journalist in her 20s. He said, yeah, that's fine. We can do an interview. Yeah, that's great. She said, okay, well, I want to do this, a one-on-one interview. Oh, that's fine. He said, my aide will be here and somebody else. No, she said. It's got to be a one-on-one interview, just you and me in your office. He said, I don't do that. And, oh, why don't you do that? Well, because I'm a married man and part of the arrangement that my wife and I have had since the day we got married is that we are not going to be alone in a room with anyone of, of another gender. It's just, that's just not something we do. And oh, she gave him such grief about how he couldn't control himself and all this other stuff, and she just didn't understand. She refused to understand that purity and sincerity was so important to this man that he really didn't care what she thought. This is what he was going to do. And if you're going to meet with him, you're going to meet with him on those terms. And I really appreciate that. She tried to drag him through the mud for it, and everybody's like, no, actually, that's a pretty good idea. (laughs) I mean, imagine how our world would be better if people maintained that level of integrity and sincerity about all kinds of things in life. And you know, during that period of time when Mike Pence was the vice president, whether you liked the role of the president at the time or not, whether you liked the political situation that was going on or not, you got to give Pence his due. He was never caught up in any scandal. Not a one. Nothing. Ever. Four years being the second most watched human in America and not a single scandal of any kind. In this one, his boss is getting caught up in all kinds of scandals, whether they were legitimate or not. He was caught in all of them. How did Pence manage to do that? I'll bet Kamala Harris would like to know how Pence managed to do that because she can't turn around without getting caught up in something these days. It was because he didn't just wake up one day as the vice president and make this decision, but throughout his entire life, he was first a Christian minister. And so he said, a servant, an ambassador. And so he said, purity, sincerity, and and chastity, morality, are going to be hallmarks of my life. You better believe there were people trying to dig stuff up on the guy. There was nothing to dig up because he operated in purity. Paul's saying, this is what I've done. Since becoming a Christian believer, I have operated this way. And people tried to dig up stuff against Paul all the time. We see it continuously. Matter of fact, I came across, as I was studying this, I came across, oh gosh, I didn't, I didn't write it down in my notes, a, um, a first century, or pardon me, a second century author, historian, secular guy, who was still dragging Paul's name through the mud, trying to write up this connection between him and Simon the sorcerer back in Acts, which actually is a much bigger player in history than he is in the Bible. And and it was because they're still trying to drag this guy's name through the mud, and it didn't work. Because 1,900 years later, we're able to say, nope, that wasn't the truth. We have enough records of Paul to know he operated in purity. By purity, Paul says, also... He majored in knowledge. This is the term gnosis. This is before Gnosticism became a huge deal, so the the term was not yet uh, kind of tainted by that. Paul says, somebody who is a Christian minister, a Christian ambassador, ought to know. uh, Vernon McGee says, they ought not to just know the Bible. They ought to know stuff. They ought to know about the world and what's going on around them and what's happening in current events and be able to have a good understanding. This idea of locking yourself in a building somewhere and doing nothing but studying the Bible for 40 years sounds wonderful. That's not what Paul's talking about. They ought to know. Paul's a good example of that. He quotes uh, other uh, non-biblical people from time to time that were popular in the day. He talks about things with a great understanding of current events. Good Christian ought to know. And they ought to major in the Holy Spirit. They ought to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. The only way we're going to know the difference between right, wrong, good, and bad is with the Holy Spirit. We are called again and again and again to be discerning people. Oh, judge not, lest ye be judged. That's not what that means, people. 
We are to be discerning people. We are to be able to look at a situation and know if it's right or wrong. How are we going to do that? Well, we need to know the word. A lot of it's in here. But, you know, the word doesn't talk about electric cars. But the Holy Spirit probably will. I told my teenagers one time, we were talking, and somehow we got on the concept of God talking to people. And I told them, if there is something you really need to know from God, and you put yourself to that thing, you make that the most important thing in your life, and you put in the work to hear from God, you will. He'll tell you every time. This is what Paul's talking about. By the Holy Spirit. Oh, I skipped a couple. By purity, by knowledge. I skipped this one on purpose. By patience. We're again supposed to be patient. By kindness. Oh my gosh. Can we, can we do that? Do you think we can be kind? I had uh, somebody talk about the difference between people who are nice and people who are kind. And they said the people in, in the Northeast are not nice, but they're kind. The people in the Northwest are kind, but they're not nice. And what they meant was, if you have a flat tire in Buffalo, New York, somebody's going to come along and totally berate you. They are not nice. They're going to stand there and say all kinds of things about how dumb you are for getting a flat tire and not knowing how to fix it and what's the matter with you. And the whole time they're going to be changing their ti- your tire for you because they're kind, but not nice. The people in the Pacific Northwest, they said, well, well, they're really nice. If you have a flat tire, they'll stop and, oh, that's too bad. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. And then they'll drive off because they're not kind. You understand? Paul says we need to be people who are kind. I don't know about being, you know, like in the Northeast. Maybe we could be both. Christian people need to be the kindest people. You know, Jay Leno uh, had a big fire on his face a couple weeks ago. You might have read about that. He was talking about how people sent him flowers and cards from all over the world all these celebrities and stuff. But the cards and flowers that meant the most to him were ones that came from just average people. He said he got one from a guy that said, hey, you might not remember me, but I was broken down on the side of one of the streets around there one day and you were driving by and you just stopped and helped me out and got my car going again. And I just, I just, really, appreciate, I just really appreciate that. And, and I heard you got hurt and I just wanted to say, you know, that I'm thinking about you. He said, man, that, you know, that really meant something to him. Two people being kind to one another. When people think of Christians, man, wouldn't it just be great if the first thing they thought was, those are some, those are some kind people. Yeah, Paul says we should be kind by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, that is genuine agape, is what that literally says, by genuine agape. And, verse 7, then, what tools would he use to, ma- to uh, master, to major in these sources? Well, by the word of truth, that would be, of course, the scripture that we hold. By the power of God, which enables him. Through weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left. Depending on how you interpret what it says, it, it means one of two things. It means either armor of righteousness by the armor of righteousness. Or if you want to say it means weapons of righteousness, Paul says the right hand and the left. I actually kind of like that because it has to do with both offensive and defensive weapons. The defensive weapon goes in the left hand. The offensive weapon goes in the right hand. Paul says we have weapons of righteousness, which is either armor, or weapons of righteousness, which are defensive and offensive. So by existing in righteousness by doing what's right in the eyes of God, living in a way where we are right in the eyes of God. When others come to attack us, we have both defense and offense because we've been doing what's right. Think about Mike Pence again is another good example. Anytime somebody tried to come at him, there was just nothing. He was totally defended. That's what Paul's talking about there. Verse 8 through glory and dishonor. In other words, when people have been thinking we're great and when people have been putting us down. Through slander and good report. Sometimes they say lies about us. Sometimes they say the truth. Regarded as deceivers, yet telling the truth. Hey, you know what? Let's go back to slander and good report. 
I was thinking quite a bit about that today, I can tell because I wrote quite a bit of notes. And uh, one of the things I wrote is I remembered 1 Peter 4.14. If you are ridiculed for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the Spirit of God rests on you. Same thing Jesus said in the Beatitudes, blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you, when they insult you, when they slander your name because of the Son of Man. Why are you blessed in that case? Because they did the same thing to him. Regarded as deceivers, yet untrue. You know, Jesus was regarded as a deceiver. Remember in Matthew 28, after Jesus had died and was buried, and the high priest went to uh, Pilate and said, when that deceiver was still alive, he said that he was going to be alive again in three days, and that would be worse deception than the first. So seal up the tomb. So if, if you're regarded as a deceiver, but you're not a deceiver, then, then you're being Christ-like. Now, if you're regarded as a deceiver, and you are, I mean, you know, if, if you're out there hawking used cars all the time, I can say that since, you know. Anyway, then, uh, then you better watch it. But if you're not, well, then you're being treated as Christ was treated. Unknown and yet recognized. Unknown by the world, and yet recognized by whom? Well, if you're going to want to be recognized, there's probably two groups you want to be recognized by. You want to be recognized by Christ, obviously. And you want to be recognized by the adversary. Somebody, who was it? One of the guys I was reading said, if they have meetings about you in hell, then you're right on track. Remember the seven sons of Sceva? In the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, come out! They said to the man with the demon, And then the demon says, well, I I know about Jesus, and I know about Paul, but who are you? And overpowered him, and the seven sons of Sceva left naked and screaming and crying out in the street. Yeah, you you, want to be recognized by the right people. You want to be recognized by Christ. I mean, imagine being, you know, one of the most recognizable faces in the world, Princess Diana style, getting up into heaven, standing there in front of the Bema seat, and Jesus said, so, so who are you again? Can you, do you have like a name tag or something? That would be a problem. But imagine being completely unrecognized and yet getting to heaven and he's standing there with his arms wide open and calls your first name and says, I've been waiting for you. That would be okay. Paul says, we are, we are unknown yet recognized. We're regarded as dying. Yet look, we're still alive. Everybody says we're on our way out, and yet here we are still doing the job. We're regarded as being disciplined, and yet not killed. That is that that training level of discipline, but not overpowered, not killed. We're regarded as grieving, and yet we're always rejoicing. People are like, oh, poor Paul. Oh, did you hear what happened? Oh, poor Paul. That guy must really be taking it rough. But then you meet him, and he's just full of joy. Man, the book of, uh, the, the letter that he wrote to the Philippians is a great example of that. Here he is in a jail, rotting, thinking he's going to die there. And the book is just loaded with joy. I mean, it's almost, it's almost giddy when you read it. This is what we were talking about last week in the Sunday sermon. There's a joy that's got to come from somewhere else. It's not based on our circumstances here in this life. It's based on who God is and what he's done for us. And the fact that he knows our name that kind of joy. Um, We are uh, regarded as poor and yet enriching many. Regarded as though we have nothing to offer and yet everywhere we go, people are enriched and he doesn't mean physically. We're regarded as having nothing and yet possessing everything. They have nothing. And, And Paul would be a great example. I mean, he gave up all of his wealth in being a Christian. The guy had nothing. Matter of fact, he wanted a coat and he left it somewhere and he had to have Timothy go get it and try to bring it to him in jail. I mean, he had nothing. And yet he says, we possess everything. I'm never lacking. I always have everything that I need and more. And then um, verse 11, Paul says, we have spoken openly to you, Corinthians. Our heart has been opened wide. We've told you all of this. We've presented everything to you. We've hid nothing from you. Our complete uh, 
commendations, you've seen yourselves. We haven't withheld the truth in any way. You've seen this. Verse 12, we are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding your affection from us. Remember, th- this is going to sound bordering medically inappropriate. Remember that in the culture that they lived in at the time, the seat of the emotions was not necessarily the heart. The seat of the emotions was the bowels. This is a very Hebrew Jewish thing. Still in, in many Middle Eastern concepts, the seat of the emotions in the bowels. Makes sense because, you know, there's a direct link between your mind and your digestive system as far as the nervous system goes. So when you, that's why when you start to get upset up here, you feel it here, right? You get nervous up here, you feel it here. You know, you have a real problem with grief or a real problem with anxiety or something like that. It can upset your stomach. So what this literally says, Paul says, when it says we're not withholding our affection from you, but you're withholding your affection from us, he's saying you have a restriction in your bowels. We don't have a restriction. You have a restriction. So things aren't working correctly because of this restriction. And it's your problem, your fault. You're, you're the ones tightening it up. So the people had come and said, you know, Paul's being mean. He's not, he's not treating you appropriately. He's not giving you all the information. He's not treating you in the way that a teacher ought to treat the students. He says, no, 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 no. We are doing that for you. The problem is you're not reciprocating. You have a restriction. He says in verse 13, I speak as to my children as a proper response. Open your heart to us. Remove the restriction. I speak as to my children. This is how I talk to my children, he says. I love you as children, as my children, and I'm, I'm treating you just as I would them, and so you treat me the same. Verse 14, don't become partners with those who do not believe. Now, hold on. I don't want you to put a big line and a space there like maybe your Bible doesn't say, now he's on to another topic. He's not. He was just telling them, this is how a Christian minister ought to look. This is how a Christian minister ought to behave. This is how we're behaving for you. I've opened my heart and my life to you. Open your heart and your life back to me. Don't become partners with those who don't believe. Don't be yoked together in unbelief, is what it says in what you've read before. Don't become partners with those who don't believe. For what partnership is there between righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship does light have with darkness? What agreement does Christ have with Belial? Apparently the situation is, these people are, rather than partnering with Paul in their faith, they're choosing to partner with others in their faith. Others are coming in to teach them things that aren't coming from the same spot in faith. And these guys are saying, oh, you sound real good. Yeah, yeah, we'll go with you. Paul's saying, don't do that. And to illustrate his point, he brings up something that's in Leviticus 13. Leviticus, Leviticus, maybe I wrote it down, maybe I didn't. And also Deuteronomy 22, I can't remember where it is in Leviticus, where uh, Moses tells the people not to plow with two different kinds of animals. Don't plow with a donkey and an ox. If you don't have two oxen, then you're going to need to get another one. Don't put the two together. And the reason you don't put the two together is for a number of reasons. There's a spiritual application we'll get to. But very physically, it doesn't make sense because the ox goes one speed in one direction. The mule goes another speed in another direction. It's not going to work. It won't be effective. You won't do a good job. Don't do it. Even if those are the only two animals you have, that's not going to work. Now, there's a spiritual application as well, and that's what Paul is bringing up here. It doesn't work for two people who have two very diametrically opposed belief systems to try to plow together, to try to work together in life. It doesn't work. Don't do it. Paul has told us similar kinds of things before. In business, don't have a business partner who's not a Christian. Why? Because they're going to go one direction in one speed and you're going to go another direction in another speed and it's not going to work. It's not going to work. There was a um, Christian 
writer in the middle of the second century wrote a big thing in 160. His name is Tertullian. You've probably heard of him. Big, big author and, and church leader. Tertullian was teaching on this passage. This was during a time when Christianity was really starting to come out, if you will, of the Roman Empire, really starting to separate itself from every other type of faith. It was really showing itself as a, as a special and different kind of faith during that time when people were thinking Christians were really weird, strange people trying to figure out what they were all about. Tertullian was teaching on this in a community that was heavy with business people who had always partnered in business with whoever was best and available. And Tertullian is saying, don't do that anymore. Because what fellowship does light have with darkness? And they said, but Tertullian, come on, man, be practical. We have to make a living. And Tertullian looked at them and said, do we? Brilliant. Matthew chapter 6 says we don't. Matthew chapter 6 says we seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. We put that first and just let him take care of the rest. And every Christian I've ever known who has done that with their life, myself included, says, man, it worked out better than anything I could have done in business. By choosing to put him first and follow him first, he took care of the rest. That's what, that's what he tells us. What partnership is there between righteousness and lawlessness? One person's trying to skirt all the rules and you're trying to do it right. How's that going to work? What fellowship does light have with darkness? By the way, absolutely none. If you walk into a dark room and turn on the light, the dark leaves. It's just that simple. What agreement does Christ have with Belial? Now, that's a really interesting phrase right there. First of all, that term Belial uh, or uh, son of Belial, you've probably heard that term as well, um, means an, an literally a naughty person. And it actually comes from a um, popular uh, phrase that they had at the time referring to wicked people or naughty people as, as Belial. Uh, I didn't do enough research to really get deep into it other than that. I got really caught up in another word in there, and the word in there is agreement. And that word agreement is the word symphonesis, which is where we get the term symphony or symphonic. How can somebody who is in Christ, make a symphonic sound, work together in synergy, have harmony, work together in balance with someone who, instead of being in Christ, is in naughtiness. Somebody who's really into being bad. How can there be a symphony? Wow, I like that. I, I, I like that. We're told all through the Bible that God sings over us, that we are his poema, his poem. He wants us to be a people of symphony. When I was in band, they used to teach me that the band is only as good as its worst player. Did you ever hear that in band? I always tried to make sure I wasn't the worst. Second worst, maybe, but not the worst because I didn't want to stick out like that and mess up the whole band and drag the whole band down. It's only as good as its worst player. There was that TV show, they're only as good as the weakest link. Bye-bye. Well, this is what he's saying here. You're only going to sound as good as the most righteous person you have. So when you're making your agreements in life, make agreements with righteous people so that you sound good. Or what does a believer really have in common with an unbeliever? Well, we have a lot in common, but we also don't have anything in common. I mean, if you really think about it, a believer and an unbeliever, yeah, we share space on this planet. We have families. We might have some similar interests. But ultimately, everything about us is different because we died in Christ and are a whole new kind of creature, a whole new kind of creation, something totally different. I mean, I have a lot in common with my dog. He lives at my house. He doesn't like strangers. Is there, is there, he likes whipped cream. I like whipped cream. I guess, I guess that's about it. I guess that's, he likes to sleep. I like to sleep. I guess he likes to sleep a lot more than me, but you know, I don't, I don't like howl at people and stuff, but 
I hope I smell better than he does. But ultimately, we might share space, but we're two completely different kind of creatures. And we have two completely different sets of priorities that are, that are different. And this is what Paul's saying. Um, what agreement does the temple of God have with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God said. I will dwell and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch any unclean thing and I will welcome you. And I will be a father to you and you will be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Now pause real quick. We're going to get into that real quick. But I just want to make one little comment about that section. Did you realize that little section where Paul said and, and God says comes from at least three, maybe four, maybe 12 different sections of Scripture? If your Bible is one that breaks down the footnotes down at the bottom that tells you where it comes from, there's got to be 10 or 12 different references potentially down there that that's from. It's not all from the same section of Scripture. As a matter of fact, if you look really carefully, you'll see a lot of those words like darn even included. Just stuff Paul added in. You know what Paul is doing? Is he's saying, listen, we got to behave this way because the Bible says something about this. But he doesn't say, yeah, back in the second book of Hesitations, chapter 3, verse 16 through verse 17b. And the reason I bring that up is because I think a lot of times that's what we think we have to do. Well, people say, what's the Bible say about such and so? Well, I know it says something, but I can't remember the chapter and verse, so I guess I'm out. No. You know, Paul quotes the Old Testament sometimes by saying, somewhere it says, I, I, somewhere it says this, it, I, just, I know it's in there. Good enough. Don't think that because you don't have the chapter and verse memorized. You know, I know it says, listen, I don't remember where, but I know it says that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. Good enough. Don't know the whole verse. Don't know it's John 3, 16. It's okay. I know it says that whoever believes in him has eternal life. I know it does. And that's good enough for me. And if it's not good enough for the guy you're talking to, well, then have another conversation later after you've looked it up. But it's perfectly acceptable. You know, I know it says God loves you in there. I can't remember where, but it really doesn't matter. Hey, let, let's just sit and look and we'll dig through it together and see if we can find it. That's perfectly acceptable. And that's what Paul does right here. He says, God said these things. God said these things. He might not have said them in this order. They might not all come together just like this, but God said it, and so we can trust it. What did God say? This is really interesting. And there's a really cool little sermon in here because Paul has just told us if we choose to come out from the unbeliever, if we choose to, to step away from partnering with situations that aren't good for our faith, that God will do some things for us. What will he do? First, it says, I will dwell and walk among them. He'll be right there with you. I'll be their God and they'll be my people. We'll be able to name him as ours and he will name us as his. Therefore, come out from among them, be separate through the Lord, and do not touch any unclean thing. That's the Old Testament concept of unclean. That's purposefully handling something you know God doesn't want you to handle. And I will welcome you, he says. You'll be welcome in my presence. You can just boldly come before the throne. And I will be a father to you, not just a God, but a father to you. And you'll be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. He'll walk among us, he'll welcome us, and he'll be our father. Not that he's, well, not that he's not our father. I mean, he's our, our father anyway, right? Because if you're in Christ, he's... What's he talking about there? Did you, ever, uh, did you ever take your kids to a restaurant? I remember before Mom and I, before Wendy and I had kids, we, uh, we said we were never going to do that. We'd go out to the restaurant and see these people arm wrestling their kids, you know, their toddlers. I remember we went to this one place. It was IHOP, I think. And there was this kid there that was just being Captain Brat. And his mom was like, oh, oh, little Jimmy, please don't put ice cubes down your pants. I am not making it up. <laughs> please put your waffle in your mouth and not in your shirt. Oh, that kid, he needed a walloping. But anyway, nonetheless, I remember saying we were never going to do that. We were going to never take 
our kids to a restaurant. Yeah, that didn't, no, because we did multiple times take them to a restaurant. And you know, generally, I was, I was pretty proud of them. I was pretty proud to call them my kids. They were pretty good. I mean, they fought each other, but for the most part, they were pretty good kids. They, were, they did not put the ice cubes down their pants. They were good kids. And I didn't really have a problem with it. You've taken your kids too. Would you take your kid to a restaurant if he was covered in mud? You know, you guys are going to go out to Red Robin, get some clucks and fries. You go to get little Johnny from the yard. He was supposed to be dressed up and looking good, but by the time you get there, he'd been rolling in the mud. Are you going to be like, yep, this one's mine. Proud of this kid. Yeah, oh, come on, Johnny. Let's go to Red Robin. No, you're not. You're not. You're going to tell him, get cleaned up or we're staying home. Right? That's kind of the impression that I get here. Yeah, he's our father. He wants to be proud of us. These are my kids. Proud of my kids. Hmm, just a thought. So then, dear friends, since we have these promises, let us cleanse ourselves from every impurity of the flesh and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. That's a heavy one right there. So then, dear friends, since we have these promises, what promises? That he's going to be with us, he's going to walk with us, he's going to be our father, we're going to be his children. Since we have those promises, let us cleanse ourselves from every impurity of the flesh and spirit. Wait a minute. Um, doesn't it say in 1 John, if we say we have fellowship with him and we walk in the darkness... We're lying and not practicing the truth, but if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Doesn't it say that he cleanses us? Yeah. Yeah, we're cleansed by God. And there's multiple, multiple verses. Cleansed by the Holy Spirit. Then what does it say? Let us cleanse ourselves from every impurity of the flesh and spirit. Hmm. Well, those would be those things, the mud that we're rolling in, is what that would be. We, we need to stop rolling in the mud. Let's cleanse ourselves from every impurity of the flesh. What would be an impurity of the flesh? Well, those would be those fleshly temptations we all know about and don't like to talk about. Y you know, sexual immorality, greed, chemicals we might want to use, food we might want to gorge on, you know, those kinds of things that we just shouldn't, we shouldn't be doing and we know it. Impurities of the flesh. What, what would be the impurities of the spirit? Well, those would be those, those things that, that really are, are more about what's going on inside of us than outside of us. These would be things like um, unrealistic anxieties. These would be things like... Uh, Fault finding, having a critical spirit, or laziness, which is dealt with huge in the book of Proverbs, or cynicism. That's not really a that's not really an issue of the flesh, but honestly it's worse. It's more dangerous. Those uh, those thoughts that we get that we know we shouldn't entertain, but we just really like to have them around. Those kinds of things. Paul says, quit doing that. Quit rolling in the mud with those things. Get, get yourself cleaned up. Cleanse yourself. Cleanse yourself, Paul says. How do we cleanse ourselves? People say, Pastor, I'm, I'm dealing with these thoughts and I just don't know what to do with it. How do I cleanse myself? You know, in the Bible, it tells us that uh, the way that a young man cleanses his ways, Psalm 119, is by taking heed to the word. Ephesians 5 tells us that we are to be washed with the water that is the word. John 15, 3, Jesus tells us, now you're clean by the word that I've spoken to you. Did you know in the Old Testament, washing water is always symbolic of the word of God? Don't really have time to go back and look at all of the references, but it sure makes sense when you start thinking about the bronze laver out in front of the tabernacle that the guys have to be washed in before they can sacrifice. The in the Old Testament, washing water is the word of God. 
How are we cleansed? How are we cleansed? How do we cleanse ourselves from every impurity of the flesh and spirit? How do we cleanse ourselves? You know, one of my favorite Old Testament stories is the story of Naaman. Remember Naaman? That's uh, 2 Kings 5. Naaman had leprosy. He was an important guy. I mean, like a really important guy. Everybody knew Naaman's name. He was important. He got leprosy, and, and that made him unclean. He couldn't be around other people then and that sort of thing. And so he heard about a prophet in Samaria that knew God personally. And he thought, well, I'm going to go see this prophet, and he's going to contact God, and they're going to have potions and powers and dances and all kinds of things like that, and they're going to make me clean. So he went to see, Na- uh, Naaman went to see Elijah, Elisha. And Elisha said, go wash with water seven times in the Jordan. I have time to talk to you. Just go wash with water seven times. And Naaman was all mad. And, and he said, why does he want me to wash in that mud hole? I'm perfectly clean. Look at me. I took a bath before I got here. And if I'm going to go wash in a river, there's a much better river back in my hometown. What's his problem? And one of Naaman's guys pulled him aside and said, I'm sorry, my master, but if he'd asked you to do some great and mighty thing, would you have done it? Of course. If he wanted you to scale the highest mountain, well, then I'd have scaled it. If he wanted you to go to the lowest valley, well, then I'd have gone to the lowest valley. Well, then why don't you just go wash? And he did. Seven times. Seven is the number of completion. He washed until it was done. And he was clean. He was made like like brand new baby, it says. His skin was like a baby skin. He was completely clean. Sometimes I think we struggle with, uh, with thoughts in our minds or attitudes of our heart or things we, we know we shouldn't be involved in. And we pray to God and we say, take this away. And we're looking for God to give us some great thing. All right, then, if you really want this to go away, then get that new devotional book and read it every day and don't stop and pray every day and stand on your head while you do it. And witness 46 times today on your way to work. All he asks us to do is wash. Wash until it's gone. And we say, I'm not gonna, are you, I'm not gonna come to Bible study on Wednesdays. I got other stuff to do. I'm not gonna get up early in the morning. I don't, I don't even know what I'm reading half the time. Just wash. Wash until it's gone. You just keep reading and studying and washing in the word until it's gone. Let us cleanse ourselves from every impurity of the flesh and spirit bringing holiness to completion till it's done in reverence to God. We're going to have to stop there. We might actually pick back up with that verse next time when we get started, and then we'll finish up this little section in uh, chapter 7 and on to 8. See, we made it into chapter 7 tonight. That's good. Yeah, that's good. So looking forward to Sunday. Um, I'm actually going to be in chapter 8 a little bit on Sunday and and looking forward to our uh, fourth Sunday of Advent on Sunday as we talk about the love that Christ has for us. Yeah, that'll be good. Oh, yeah, and Cookies and Carols Sunday night, too. Yeah, so that'll be good. You got to come to Cookies and Carols. It's going to be great. All right, let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you have led us this far. I pray, Lord, that we would get out of the mud, that we would become Christian people that are full of grace and truth and purity, that we would be good ambassadors for you. How we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.